diagnostic studies, lots of discussion in this pandemic on uh, you know positive predictive value, sensitivity of a test, prevalence, um, so on and so forth. So this is quite a, an important area uh, for all of you to be uh, kind of familiar with, right? So if it's not obvious from this pandemic, um, I think uh, diagnosis is spectacularly important, but gets very little attention in any health system. In fact, if you look at the, what we call cascade of care or continuum of care across multiple diseases, you often find that the diagnosis is the weakest link in any health system. Most people simply don't know that they have diabetes or hypertension or tuberculosis or whatever. And that, uh, that, that is a massive problem it's because countries have simply not invested in diagnostics for many, many uh, decades actually. And that's why when there's a crisis, countries simply cannot ramp up uh, capacity to, to conduct diagnostics or laboratory testing. So early and rapid diagnosis can reduce morbidity, improve patient outcomes, as well as reduce cost of care. For example, we know cancer detected early is very different from cancer detected late. Drug-resistant TB detected early is very different from drug-resistant TB detected late. So tests are quite important for detection, for prognosis, uh, for monitoring treatment over time, right? for promoting healthy behaviors, for personalized medicine, and also, as we saw in COVID, tests are also critical for surveillance. Without testing, we simply don't know what proportion of the population is, uh, is infected or not. So uh, in the last couple of decades, there's been an explosion in the type of diagnostic technologies. In the past, we used to think that uh, diagnostics means you went to a laboratory. I really don't think that is uh, valid anymore. You can do tests at home now. You could even test yourself uh, for HIV in the, in the comfort of your own home. You can get an EKG on your watch right now. Um, you can have molecular tests that you can take into, into the field, uh, into a primary care clinic. You can even uh, send an oral swab by post and order yourself a, a genome uh, sequencing um, done. Um, so a tremendous movement in the types of diagnostic technologies that are now available and will come on board in the coming years. But question is, are they really accurate, right? Accuracy is one of the most important things that we expect in a diagnostic uh, test, any diagnostic test. And you always have to worry whether these technologies or tests are accurate enough. Uh, for example, every one of us has experienced uh, walking through an airport body scanner with suddenly beeps, right? And then turns out that we did have, didn't have anything on us or we had, I don't know, a small nail clipper in our uh, wallet, whatever. Um, these technologies in the airport have their own sensitivity and specificity. They do make mistakes and they also miss people who are carrying guns and bombs. So no technology is perfect. Every technology has its own uh, inherent error um, that we need to worry about. So how do we uh, measure the accuracy of any uh, technology? Just like drugs and vaccines, all diagnostic tests require adequate independent validation before they can be used on people, right? Um, regulatory agencies such as FDA in the US or DCGI in India um, must um, make sure any test that is on the market and clinically used is of a certain quality and acceptable accuracy before, uh, before it can be used uh, for clinically, uh, clinical purposes. And in this COVID pandemic, one of the most interesting uh, things to observe is so many COVID tests have been fast tracked to market put on market and clinically used with virtually no validation, right? Apart from what the manufacturer says, there's absolutely nothing available on most tests and yet we've started using them clinically as well as for prevalence surveys, which poses all sorts of interesting uh, dilemmas. Um, you know, in a crisis, governments feel compelled to push things out. Um, the flip side of that is that we've now learned of uh, some very dubious quality tests uh, from China and from Korea and whatnot. I'm not 
honestly sure about the quality of the new COVID test put on the market in India. I have no confidence on how good they are or not. Um, and we just taking it on faith uh, that they're okay. But we know a false positive COVID result or a false negative COVID result has huge consequences for the patients. And so, so just like drug trials, we need to do diagnostic trials. That's the only way we'll know for sure um, a new test is uh, up to scratch or not. Before I talk about um, how we evaluate diagnostic uh, products, I want to kind of separate diagnosis from screening. And this is really important for all of us to understand. A diagnostic test is done on sick people, right? If I have chest pain and I'm symptomatic and I run to the hospital emergency room and they do an ECG on me or a, a, a stress test on me, that is a diagnostic uh, situation, right? I'm symptomatic, I'm ill, I'm seeking care. My risk of heart disease is already higher than someone who's healthy and sitting at home, right? Because I'm symptomatic, I have sought care, which already makes my pre-test probability of heart disease much higher than somebody who's not symptomatic and he's happily sitting at home, right? So keep in mind, any diagnostic test is inherently done on sick people who are presenting to the health system. They are already presenting with a fairly high pre-test probability of disease. In other words, disease prevalence among sick people presenting in the hospital is higher than the prevalence of the same disease if you go door to door and look for uh, to recruit people in the community. Screening test is a situation when nobody is running to us necessarily wanting to be screened or sick enough to be screened, we want to screen them because we are uh, wanting to catch the disease very early and intervene, right? Screening tests are usually done on asymptomatic and apparently healthy people, right? So we tell uh, a woman who's in her 40s or 50s, come for a pap smear, right? We want, we are worried, we want to check if there's early cervical cancer. We tell the men 50 plus older, come and get a mammography done. You may not have symptoms, you may, you may feel perfectly fine, but we wanna check. That's a screening environment, which is very different from a diagnostic environment. If a woman feels a lump in her breast and shows up at the doctor and says, I'm worried, that's a diagnostic situation. But if we invite healthy women to come and get a mammography done once a year, that's a screening situation. The diagnostic situation invariably is a higher prevalence of disease and higher likelihood of uh, disease even before testing. So the pre-test probability of disease is high. Screening situation, uh, pre-test probability of disease is very low, okay? Very, very low at the population level. And so the way we think about diagnosis is a game of probability, okay? Uh, probability is absolutely fundamental in thinking about diagnosis. Um, and and um, I will tell you more about how Bayesian thinking works. Uh, when you say somebody is Bayesian, you take it that they're inherently people who are comfortable in thinking about moving probabilities up and down on the scale. So here is how we think about it. At, uh, think of a scale which goes from um, zero to 100. Okay, zero means zero probability of the disease, whatever the disease is, and 100 means 100% 100 sure that the disease is uh, present, okay? And the way we see it is that that's the probability of diagnosis, zero to 100% on that scale. And when the probability of disease is very low, right, under a certain, uh, threshold, which we call the test threshold, that the decision to test is a test threshold, right? Now, if you are absolutely well, you are in your 30s, you have no uh, history of heart disease, you don't have any symptoms, should we be doing a, a stress treadmill test on you? The answer is no. Why? Because your likelihood of cardiac disease is so low you are under the test threshold. 
okay there is no reason at all why well, anybody should be testing you at this point and this is one of the biggest problems in doing these master health checkups where you do 50 tests on healthy people that's a dangerous game to play because you are looking for diseases that are so rare and then you will find some vague results that you can't understand or interpret easily so when you are when your prior probability of disease is very low just don't test okay when your prior probability of disease or when your probability of disease is very high, I don't know, 80%, 90%, then just treat, right? You are well past the treatment threshold. At this point, you should be really treating, right? The biggest problem with diagnosis is where we really need testing is in the middle. That middle zone is where all the uncertainty really lies where somebody is not practically zero risk of disease or not practically clearly having the disease somewhere in between. Now that is the zone of uncertainty where all diagnostic tests action really happens. And when you are in that probability zone, that's when you need help, right? Every clinician, every doctor, every hospital is puzzled on what to do with that person and they will need to test at that point in time, right? Now, in an ideal world, and you've seen this before, uh, everybody who has a disease will have a clearly visible profile, whatever the test result is, right? Everybody, for example, with heart disease will be positive on a, on a cardiac enzyme. Everybody without heart disease will be negative on that cardiac enzyme, and they nicely, beautifully separate each other. The, the distribution of the results of a test will not overlap between the disease and the non-disease people, right? In, in reality, this situation is virtually never seen in clinical medicine, right? What we do see in reality is a tremendous degree of overlap between people with and without the disease on whichever test we look at, right? Which is why there is always uncertainty about a test result because you could fall in this overlap zone right where you are not diseased but you have a rather high value on the test or you are diseased but you happen to have a low value on the test so no matter where you draw the cutoff whether it's cholesterol or blood pressure um, you know high blood pressure cholesterol uh, your uh, uh, body mass index i don't care what cutoff you use you will misclassify some people right Healthy people will get classified as, uh, as hypertensive. Hypertensive people will be missed. This is the reality with which we live in. And quantifying this uncertainty is one of the central purposes of doing diagnostic research, right? No test is 100% uh, sensitive and specific. So all we can do is to accept that uncertainty and, and use that well in, your, in, your, in our clinical or public health work. But it also means cut points matter a lot. Cut points are cutoff points, right? So how do you say, what is the cutoff for a fasting blood sugar, right? How much should it be before you categorize someone as diabetic, right? Um, uh, how, you know, systolic of 140 millimeter mercury, diastolic of 90 millimeters mercury is a cutoff widely used for deciding who's hypertensive or not, right? So we use cutoffs all the time to kind of dichotomize people as having diseased or non-diseased, but you already know from the previous chart that the cutoff is an artificial line in the sand, right? It has got, you know, no biological meaning as much as it's based on average population distributions of people with blood pressure and hypertensive disease and those without. And the cutoffs are also derived on epidemiological studies which show that when your diastolic exceeds 90, your probability of bad outcomes goes up, but it isn't a clear, sharp delineation, right? That's why they say lower the blood pressure, the better it is, but the 140, 90 is an arbitrary cutoff and cutoffs change over a period of time. In the past, 30, 40 years ago, I promise you that the hypertension cutoff was not this low. It was much higher than that, right? And over a period of time, the cutoffs have fallen and fallen and fallen based on epi studies which show uh, 
um, even a 10 millimeter mercury increase is bad for long-term cardiovascular outcomes, right? Same thing for diabetes. The cutoff for diabetes has steadily gone down over a period of time because we know higher the glycemic levels, greater the risk of bad outcomes. So cutoffs are not uh, fixed in, uh, in time. Cutoffs are arbitrary, but cutoffs are important and all cutoffs are a compromise, right? Wherever you draw the line, you're gonna misclassify some people one way or the other. So if you look at tuberculin skin test, we are always fighting over whether the cutoff should be five millimeters, 10 millimeters, 15 millimeters. And there is no end to that discussion because the number of millimeters is just a readout of the test. Uh, we always have to find a way to put a cutoff and make, uh, make judgments on the basis of that. So there is no perfect test. And, and nobody understood better than Reverend Thomas Bayes. So Bayes uh, wrote this uh, very seminal piece of work, an essay towards solving a problem in the doctrine of chances, right? Um, chance is all about, uh, you know, the Bayesian theory, right? So there are many formulations of the Bayesian theory, um, but the one that I like the most, which I think is spectacularly uh, easy to understand, the Bayes theory says, if you took what you knew before or what you thought before the test, and then you did the test, which gives you some new information, and you combine the two, you get what you think now, right? Pre-test probability is what we thought before we, do, we did the test, right? That's the profile of somebody who walks into the hospital. How old they are, male, female, do they have chest pain? Do they have typical COVID symptoms or they don't have typical COVID symptoms? Were they in contact with someone with COVID? Did they just come from another country? All that is captured in this pre-test probability, also called prior probability, okay? And we can convert probability into odds, as you know, right? And then the test is done, right? That could be the COVID PCR test. So you take the prior probability of the patient, their symptoms, their profile, and you get some information from the test. The test produces sensitivity and specificity, classifies people with a certain error, which is actually calculable using a number called likelihood ratio. So you take the pre-test odds, you multiply it by the likelihood ratio, you get post-test odds, which is the same as post-test probability. So somebody walks in with typical COVID symptoms, has history of contact with someone with COVID, then you do a PCR, PCR is positive. The chances of this person, the post-test probability of COVID is probably close to 100%. Why? Because you had a pretty powerful pre-test probability already. Then the, you did a, let's say a good quality PCR with reasonably high accuracy. The test is positive. Then your post-test probability is practically 100%. You just take it that it's COVID, right? But if you start off with a very low prior probability, and if you do a test that is dodgy, not very accurate, then you end up with a weird post-test probability, which still leaves you scratching your head on whether this person has COVID or not. So if you understood this Bayes theorem, then the Bayesian approach to diagnosis works as follows. A great test is one where you begin maybe with a low pre-test probability, then you do the test, the test result comes back, and the test is good enough to push you to a very high post-test probability, right? If you go from low to a very high post-test probability, that's a good test, why? Because it's helping you rule in the disease, right? We call it rule in. Also called, it helps you confirm the presence of a disease. That means this is a good test because it's clearly telling you, yes, this person has COVID, or heart disease or cancer and you're done, you can begin the treatment. So this is a good situation to be, okay? The test has enough value, enough accuracy to push you from a low to a high level of uh, pre-test to post-test probability. The converse is also a very good test. You may start off with a fairly high suspicion of a disease. The test result comes back negative, right? Now you end up with a low post-test probability. We call this ruling out a disease, 
we love tests that can rule out diseases, right? Because often you're confused about something, you want to just rule out the disease and move on, right? Um, so somebody ha has chest pain, you're not quite sure they have cardiac um, coronary artery disease or not. You do an angiogram, angiogram is clean, and you say, you know what? You don't have coronary artery disease, just go home, be done. The, the, the problem is solved, right? So this is also a great test. Any test where the negative predictive value is very high can help rule out the disease. In the first situation, the positive predictive value of a test is very high, you can rule in the disease, okay? Any test which has enough accuracy to help us rule in or rule out are excellent tests. What we hate in medicine is a weak test with a likelihood ratio of close to one. You take a pretest odds, you multiply it by a likelihood ratio of one, you end up with the same post-test odds, right? Any test where the sensitivity and specificity are weak, and I'll show you examples, you will end up with a very confusing post-test probability. Pre-test probability was 30%, post-test probability is 35%. You haven't made up your mind. You are still stuck in a limbo zone or a gray zone. The test doesn't have enough heft or push to take you very high and rule in or very low and rule out, right? Any test which has got a weak sensitivity and specificity will still leave you scratching your head on whether this person truly has disease or doesn't. And you will be forced to test again with a different test because you haven't figured out whether this is a rule in situation or a rule out situation. So here are the steps in how we evaluate a diagnostic test, right? We first define the best gold standard or reference standard for a particular disease. Then we recruit ideally consecutive patients, consecutive patients in whom the test is genuinely indicated, in whom you suspect the disease, right? And then you do the gold standard test on all of the such patients that gives you the true disease status. And then you'd perform the new test on all the patients, okay? Everybody should get both tests, right? That's the ideal situation to be. Everybody gets the reference standard, everybody gets the new test, and then that gives you the two by two table using which you can compute sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, and likelihood ratios. So here is a nice um, visual illustration of how we think about uh, test accuracy. So imagine a hypothetical population, some with COVID and some without COVID, right? People with COVID are the black dots, people without COVID are the white dots, okay? You do the test. Let's say you do a, a PCR test. If the P PCR test was positive on every single person in this population, then you have a problem, right? Why? Because the test has picked up positivity in the black dots, which is great, but the test has also lit, lit up positive on all the people without COVID, right? This is a bad test because it is throwing up a huge number of false positives. It is picking up all the disease people, so it's highly sensitive, but it's also picking up a massive number of non-COVID patients and saying that it's positive. So this is not a good situation to be in. What about this scenario? This would be a perfect test, right? Everyone with the disease, the black dots, have turned red on the test. Everyone without the disease are turning green on the test, which means the test is negative. The test is perfect in its ability to discriminate the disease from the non-disease people. This test would have 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity, okay? But such a test practically doesn't exist in medicine, right? Very few tests in medicine have these uh, accuracy uh, values. What we do see in medicine is something like this. There will be a bunch of black dots that will be negative on the test, right? And there will be a bunch of healthy people who will lit up red on the test. So this group, the black dots that were missed by the test are the false negatives. And these healthy people 
who got picked up as positive on the test are called false positives, right? These are true negatives, true positive, false negatives, false positives, okay? This is how most tests work. And our job in a diagnostic study is to delineate how good or bad this misclassified groups are, right? What's the accuracy of the test? So the way we quantify diagnostic test accuracy is that we put disease at the top, disease present, disease absent, test on the side, test is positive, test is negative, right? And then everybody gets uh, classified into these four cell values, true positives, false positives, false negatives, and true negatives. And I've done an entire Zoom video for all of you, 15 minutes, which I'd like you to watch, where I've actually done the math and calculated that for you for a COVID example. Uh, in fact, I've used this particular example uh, for uh, which I'll show you in a second. But briefly, the way we think about sensitivity is as follows. Among all the people who truly have the disease, and the only test that can tell us that is the gold standard, among all those declared diseased by the gold standard, what fraction are test positive, right? True positives divided by all people with disease based on the gold standard is called sensitivity of a test. Ideally, you wanna see a 100% sensitive test, right? Everybody should be in cell A, right? All those that the reference standard says is disease should also be test positive then you have 100% sensitivity. Specificity is the second column, right? Among all those that the gold standard declared as negative, non-diseased, what fraction are also declared as non-diseased by the new test, right? This is cell D. And if the specificity is 100%, everybody should be in cell D, right? There should be nobody in the false positive cell. These are the two columns, and out of the diseased column and the non-diseased column, we compute two conditional probabilities. First is conditional on disease being present, sensitivity. Conditional on disease being absent is specificity. Now, we could stop here, right? Because if you did this, you get the sensitivity and specificity of any new test, and you have successfully measured the accuracy of the test. But in reality, in terms of a user's perspective, we rarely have the gold standard in real world medicine, right? We are always trying to get by with a less invasive, easier or a cheaper test. We do not wanna be doing the gold standard on everybody, right? What we do have in real world are these two numbers, right? What we have in real world is who's test positive and who's test negative, right? A test positive or a test negative is the only result we actually have in our hands because the gold standard is often not done in medicine, right? So instead of uh, an angiogram, we may only have a treadmill or a stressed a stress ECG result in our hands. And that stress test will be either positive or negative. And we have to figure out, does that mean I really have coronary artery disease or not, right? I may have an antibody test uh, in my hand for COVID and I'm asking, do, am I really COVID positive or COVID negative, right? So now we can get to compute two conditional probabilities using the horizontal rows. From the conditioning on the test result, what can we infer about the presence or absence of the disease, right? These are called predictive values. Predictive value of a positive test, also called positive predictive value. How do we get that? We say among all the test positives, not the diseased, among all the test positives, what proportion happened to be truly diseased, right? Cell A over the row total is predictive value of a positive test, right? And analogously, we can compute something called predictive value of a negative test. Among all those who are negative on the antibody test, how many were truly negative as per the gold standard, right? So we could compute two conditional probabilities from the columns, vertically downwards. We can compute two 
probabilities from the perspective of the test, which is horizontally done. So that way we can now get four conditional probabilities. Conditioning on the disease being present or absent, conditioning on the test being positive or negative. When you've done all four numbers, you pretty much gotten everything you can get out of a diagnostic two by two table. So I gave you an example in my Zoom video, which I will very, very quickly uh, go over. Here is a published study on antibody tests using PCR as the gold standard, right? And here are uh, some results from that paper, right? So they had 98 uh, people, samples, of whom about half were PCR positive for COVID. And they had some serum samples before 2019 collected. Nobody in 2019 had COVID. So presumably these were all non-COVID patients, okay? It's almost half and half, which is why the disease prevalence here is about 50%, okay? And this is important, keep that in mind. In this um, diagnostic study where the disease prevalence is about half, they found 41 people in cell A and then three and seven and 47. And using what you just learned, you can compute a sensitivity, which is about 85%. Specificity is 94, positive predictive value is 93, negative predictive value is 87, okay? If you look at the Zoom video, I've actually worked out the math on how we got those numbers. So if I look at the results, I'll say this is not a bad test at all, okay? 85% sensitivity is decent, 94% specificity is pretty darn decent. Predictive values are actually quite high, right? A 93% positive predictive value means if an antibody test came back positive, in all likelihood, that person truly has COVID, right? There's a 93% chance that anybody with a positive antibody in this study actually had COVID, right? So that's a, that's a good situation to be in, right? So here we stand. I think from a, if this test were to be used in a clinical setting where the disease prevalence is close to 50%, like in this study, then there is really no problem. Uh, with this test, okay? Seems like a pretty decent test to me. Problem is when you take the same test and you start applying to a low prevalence situation, right? So let's say instead of a 50% prevalence, I've taken it to a primary care clinic where I don't have that high a COVID uh, problem, right? Now the disease prevalence is only 30%, not 50. So what I've done is I've taken a imaginary population of thousand people, and I've multiplied it with the prevalence of 30, which should give me 300 people with disease and 700 people without disease, okay? These are hypothetical numbers. And I, you can take 1,000, you can take 10,000, you can take 1 million, right? Doesn't matter. You use an imaginary population. You fix the disease prevalence to be 30, 20, 50, whatever you want it to be. Then you use the sensitivity that you already got before, 85%. Specificity of 94, which are properties of the test, and you apply them, you get those four cell values, okay? And the Zoom video, I've explained how you actually do that, right? You take the 300, you multiply it by uh, 0.85, you get 255, and the remaining you automatically calculate, right? Same thing, you take 700, multiply it by 0.94, you get 658, and the remaining is calculated, right? So now with these new numbers, with the 30% prevalence, you can see that the positive predictive value has already dropped. It was 93% in the previous slide when the disease prevalence was half. When the disease prevalence dropped to a third, you are left with the 86% positive predictive value. You see a fair number of false positives here. 42 people were picked up as antibody positive, but they really don't have COVID. Now let's switch to a really, really low prevalence situation. When, you, when will you find a low prevalence situation? When you go do a population-based study, right? When you go to the community and recruit all sorts of people at home, or you invite them to participate in a test uh, study, like the Santa Clara County, remember Santa Clara County found one and a half percent zero prevalence, right? So if you do a, a, a zero prevalence uh, study in a very, uh, low prevalence environment in the population at large, the same test with even a fairly good sensitivity of 85 and a fairly good specificity of 94 suddenly gives you massive numbers of false positives, 
right? Out of the 76 people now, 59 are falsely positive. Only 17 truly have COVID, right? So the positive predictive value has plummeted downwards to about 20%, which means for every true positive you're finding now, there'll be nearly four false positives that you find in your study, which is why even a 94% specificity for an antibody test is simply not good enough for a population-based prevalence study because you're going to find huge numbers of people who will be antibody positive who really don't have COVID. This is just the way the math works out, okay? When you do it in a low prevalence setting, see, 2% out of 1,000 people is only 20 people with disease, right? That's a very low prevalence environment. You're going to find lots of people with false positives, which is why the big conclusion from this kind of an analysis is a test that works well in a diagnostic setting with fairly high pretest probability of prevalence would completely fall apart if taken into the population and used as a screening test, right? If I went and randomly screened people all over the place for heart disease or stroke or uh, uh, dementia or whatever, I'm guaranteed to find false positives, right? So to, to survive this, the specificity of a, of a screening test needs to be very, very high. 94 is not even close to being good enough to be able to use on a large scale population setting with a very low prevalence. And then just to close off, there are all sorts of biases we worry about in a diagnostic study, right? When we do a study. Firstly, we, we assume that there is a gold standard. What happens if there is no good gold standard? We worry about this all the time when we work on TB, right? For example, if we were to do a study on childhood tuberculosis or TB meningitis, we pretty much don't have anything like a gold standard, right? We need multiple tests to be able to figure out whether a kid has TB or not because no one test is good enough, right? Same thing, if you're looking for uh, depression, there is no single easy test to pick up depression, right? Even COVID, You'll have to use all sorts of different um, signs and symptoms and tests and CT scan and whatnot to, to figure out who has COVID or not. So the lack of a gold standard is a very genuine problem and it can lead to an underestimation of test accuracy, right? If you use a weak gold standard, then your two by two table is already misclassified and you need to worry about that a lot, right? Then there is something called spectrum bias, right? If you take people with severe disease, and then you take absolutely healthy people and you do the sensitivity specificity calculation, pretty much every test starts looking good. Why? Because you have cherry picked people from the extreme ends of the clinical spectrum. You've taken very easy, obvious, severe disease, right? And you've taken absolutely healthy people and you put them in a two by two table. You've done something like a case control study. And there is plenty of evidence that when you do that, you overestimate the sensitivity and specificity of a test because you made it easy for the test to separate the two groups because the two groups are crystal clear, black and white, right? Like I said, the biggest confusion is people in the gray zone. And there's hardly anyone in the gray zone in your study, right? Because you have cherry picked severely ill patients and absolutely healthy people and put them in a study. So watch out for diagnostic studies which takes severe hospitalized sick people and then take a bunch of medical students or uh, healthy people as controls. Because when they do that, they're violating the principle. That is why I said you need to pick consecutive people in whom the test is genuinely indicated. If you did this completely different two groups, healthy and sick, and you put them together, that is not a good way of validating a diagnostic study. And there is something called verification bias, right? When your decision to do a gold standard is dependent on your test, then you're forcing them to be correlated in your study, right? So for example, if you say, I'll do a treadmill, if the treadmill is positive, only then you will get an angio. If you did that, then the treadmill and the angio will always be well correlated because you made one a requirement to get into the second one. 
that way we are inducing a correlation between the test and the gold standard test accuracy will always be high everybody should get both right you cannot use the test to decide who gets the gold standard if you did that then that's called a verification bias and then lack of blinding is also quite an important problem ideally the person who is doing the test should not know the gold standard result in a study okay and the person interpreting the gold standard should not know what the test was right otherwise some tests are pretty soft in terms of how we interpret them and it can bias the results right for example if uh, if uh, someone was uh, doing ultrasonography okay and ultrasonography is a very observer dependent test right and i already know the test result and then i'm doing an ultrasound i can start seeing things even if they don't exist right so ideally a diagnostic study should be double blind people doing the new test should not know the results of the gold standard people who are doing the gold standard should not know the results of the new test if there is no blinding then you can overestimate diagnostic accuracy and then lastly the new test should not be part of the gold standard if it was we call that incorporation bias we've incorporated the new test into the gold standard so if you're comparing antibodies for covid against pcr then you cannot use antibodies to decide who has covid or not right you have to keep the gold standard separate from the new test only then um, the comparison is valid okay so the take home messages are no diagnostic test is perfect all need to be validated carefully before use diagnostic test and screening tests are completely different and should not be confused with each other right mammography for breast cancer screening is very different from diagnostic uh, tests for breast cancer everybody needs to understand that all tests have error right that, that includes doctors as well as patients just because you saw an abnormal looking um, ecg doesn't necessarily mean you have heart disease okay uh, or just because your ecg was normal doesn't mean you don't have heart disease um tests should always be interpreted in the context in which it is used the same test might be perfect in a hospital setting but could be a disaster in a prevalent setting because in one situation you're not using it on sick people you're using it to do disease prevalence okay and ideally and this is something very few people talk about tests should be avoided unless there's a clear indication the worst thing is to go looking for things that you don't understand right so over investigating when people are not meeting the diagnostic test criteria is a bad idea so testing all sorts of people for all sorts of diseases is the worst thing we can do because we end up with weird post test probabilities and we'll open a can of worms which will require more testing and create more headaches for the patient and the health system all right 